Welcome to Fading Memories, a supportive podcast for those of us caring for a loved one with memory loss. So we're going to talk about mindfulness today so that we can survive this journey of Alzheimer's with our loved ones a little better. But let me introduce you. It's doable. It's doable. It's (laughs) difficult, but it's doable. Yeah, that's... We can both attest to. True. Well, I'm speaking to Scott. Is it Lavitt? Lavitt, yes. Okay, one. I want to make sure I got the last name pronounced properly. Thank you. And, you and are Jennifer help- Fink, right? Correct. Okay. And you are helping to take care of your dad, right? Correct. Okay. So tell me about dad. So first. my dad was uh, diagnosed in around 2017. So a couple years now, two, three years. And had, you know, the, the scan and all of that. So the, the diagnosis was accurate. We know what what's going on, and uh, the decline has been. He's, I think. Let's see. He's coming up on his eighty fifth birthday. Okay. So, you know, he's. I, I mean, I guess. Thank God. I hate hearing about early onset. That just really, you know. I mean, we don't want to lose anybody at any age, but early onset is horrible. And um, so at 85 years old, he has declined quickly over mm-hmm. the past several years. So I came to help my mom um, coming on about a year and a half now. And I'm full time with them. And um, it's just, you know, it's very, very difficult as all of our, our caregiver listeners, viewers know, our, our fellow caregivers, you know. Mm-hmm. I mean, if nothing else, you walk out and it's like a bummer. I mean, and I don't mean to be flip in my language. I don't mean to be flip, but it is. It's a bummer. I mean, you see your loved one wasting away. It's just, you know. And so I had to to find a way to make that gray cloud into a silver lining because I live with them and I'm always seeing it. And you can't live being depressed. No, and that's not you, good for our brains. Or, or our heart. That's and true. I, we had mentioned at some point the uh, 18% statistic that mm-hmm. caregivers die before their loved ones living with Alzheimer's. Why? Because of the stress, because of the, the difficulty, the emotional difficulty, and not taking care of ourselves. Mm-hmm. And it's hard, and that's what we're going to talk about today is one way to, this is more of a mental, mental caring for ourselves I've talked to people in the past and I've got an upcoming episode on some physical stuff we can do that doesn't take a lot of time because obviously as our loved ones decline, we have less time, which is it's an even bigger bummer. See, my mom more than likely has early onset Alzheimer's. She wasn't diagnosed until 69. And you have to be diagnosed by 65, but she was in denial resisted, didn't do all the testing that would have gotten a diagnosis. And by the time she was diagnosed, it was like, yeah, duh. <laughs> didn't need a medical degree to tell you that. So, you know, she doesn't have an official diagnosis of early onset, but I pretty, I have mentioned on the podcast before, I am pretty certain that she started showing signs at about 52 and a half. And I'm 53, so not fun. <laughs> Long time. Yeah, it's been a long journey and it, you know, it was very slow and it's, you mostly look back and you go, oh, well, she was doing these things that were easy to dismiss as getting distracted, not paying attention, stress, whatever, you know, we all do things where we look back and like, what the heck was going through my mind or was anything going through my mind? And it's just because we're either not paying attention or, you know, sometimes you drive home and it's like, I don't even remember the drive home. How did I get here? And, you know, that's not necessarily Alzheimer's. It's just not paying attention. So it wasn't really obvious until you look backwards. And then you go, oh, I think it might have started back that far. But we'll never know for sure. So knowing I have a very bad family history with memory loss on my mom's side, I do everything I can to keep myself healthy and um, just keep my, you know, it's hard to keep the mind healthy. I was just visiting with my mom yesterday and I'm listening to her and she's talking, 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 and none of it makes sense. The words together make sense. The, um, 
you know, it sounds like sentences and somebody that doesn't know her would be like, oh, you know, is that the past? You know, what's she talking about? I'm like, I have no idea. It's just, I can't follow any, any coherent thread here. And it's just after about 15 minutes, I'm like, oh my God, I'm so bored. It's like, you know, and I try to engage her in different things and she's just been, she's been a lot more challenging lately. So I could use some mindfulness regardless of her being in memory care. So that's interesting that you were talking about driving and not knowing how it is you got to the office, not knowing how it is you got home. And so there's, there's what the neuroscientists consider to be the default mode network. And so the idea is that even when, um, even when we're, we're not consciously focused on something, our brain is very, very active. In fact, our brain may be more active when we're not focused on an immediate task at hand than when we are. And so what sort of things are our brain thinking about in the default network? We might be planning our dinner. What are we going to get for dinner? We might be planning that doctor's appointment. Don't forget that doctor's appointment coming up next week. Maybe we're thinking back about last year and was it wetter last winter than it is this? I don't know. That is such a beautiful car. I would love to have a car like that. I wonder what kind of car that one is. So, you know, we're, we're really, really busy. And then we get to where we're going and we look at the front of our car and go, no, no dings, no crashes. I guess that worked out. <laughs> so, so that's really the opposite of being mindful. And I find personally that when my mind is a million other places, the present can be very, very difficult, challenging even excruciating, particularly when you're talking about things like, my dad has terrible aphasia. So when you're talking about trying to make sense of uh, what seems to be a nonsensical conversation, I mean, throw me, a, throw me a proper noun here. Who are we talking about? You know, when are we talking about? Just, just the slightest little indication of subject, verb, direct object would be so appreciative and i'm talking about language here because this is how we understand our world through language and so if we start to to be aware of what's taking place at any given time and we start to think about what it is we're actually one what are we wanting to do my primary goal i determined was to give my dad the best quality of life and show him the most love that I could as these final days approach. And I mean, let's face it, we're all going out. That's, that's how it is. And that's not a sad thing. In fact, that's something I wanted to talk to you about today is that these opposites, light and dark, black and white, and there's always an opposite. So we don't have to see death as necessarily morbid, there is definitely a positive aspect to it, which is let's live mindfully right now. Let's take advantage of what's going on right now. Let's make the most of it right now. In other words, Jennifer, let's be positive, that silver lining. Let's not see it as a bummer because this time is going to pass and there's no going back to it. Let's make the most of it right now, the best that we can. And then when we reflect back, we'll have something that we can feel good about. That sounds fantastic. It sounds good. And like most things, easier said than done. Definitely. I have a long history in advertising, and I would tell you, it's fast, and it's easy, and it's inexpensive. <laughs> but these days, I'm a caregiver, and hello, real life. That is so true. I found something that really worked and, and searching for some way to honestly um, pick myself up and not to want to run away from this situation. You know, I feel a lot of compassion for my mom and my mom is in her mid seventies. Um, I think she just turned the other side of mid seventies in this last birthday. And I don't want her to be that 18 percenter. So, um, wanting her to feel joy also and wanting to help her. So I don't want to run away. I want to be there. I want to be a positive influence for my family. 
both my father who has Alzheimer's and for my mother, the caregiver. So what I came up with, what I, what I found, I didn't invent, I, I didn't mean to say that. What I found was mindfulness and compassion and self-compassion. And these are age old ideas, age old. And so I'm going to show because show and tell is so wonderful. But what I did come up with, is this idea of a welcome mat. I'm going to hold this up for you. A welcome mat. So I just took a hand towel and I wrote welcome on it. And the reason that I did that is because I want to welcome all of my emotions. Being mindful, I want to be aware of how I'm feeling at any given moment. Now there's being mindful about your loved one. There's being mindful about your husband, other people in the in the home but there's also being mindful about yourself how are you feeling i hope you're happy <laughs> he's holding up a, a rock <laughs> with a my, happy face on it <laughs> my smile stone but i'm fine so i have a welcome mat and when i sit down to meditate and the other thing that's interesting that you said is that we don't have a lot of time and as our loved ones decline we have even less and less time as we tend to them more and more Mindfulness is not necessarily about becoming a Buddha. It's not about becoming enlightened in the sense of sit down, formal meditation. What are you doing for the next three days? We're, we're heading out to the monastery. It's not <laughs> that. It's dose dependent. So the more you do, the better you get at it. So instead of just letting your mind, as we were kidding around on the drive here, the drive there, just having a free for all, woohoo, look at this, look at that. If you bring body and mind together, and they work together, the last time you tried to hang a picture and slip, boom, <laughs> ow, you knew that mind and body work together. When you hit your finger with that hammer, it was your brain that said, ouch. That is true. That's the connection here. And it's the same with every single thing. Eating ice cream, and you get that rust, and it feels good, and it tastes good. It's all mind and body. We are all one. So... As we go through our day, eating ice cream, doing things we like, doing things we don't like, such as talking to our loved one when they're not making sense, but being there, being there, simply being there. And that in and of itself is the goal. And whatever we're feeling, there's no right or wrong. We all agree it's really, really difficult. There, there's no question about that. And so this is, when I say silver lining, there's no candy coating. It's not, oh, I'm not really feeling this. It's come one, come all. So I have my welcome mat and what I'm welcoming particularly. Now, this would be for a sit down formal meditation. But as you're chopping vegetables for dinner, as you're driving, you could still be thinking about welcoming your difficult feelings. So in a sense, you're using a, a pragmatic sort of applet of a pragmatic meditation. Okay. Being mindful as you're going through your day. The stoplight, instead of a bell for a formal meditation, that stoplight is a reminder. Breathe in, breathe in, breathe out. And the breathing in and the breathing out is a biological way of calming yourself and oxygenating every single one of your cells. Imagine, I mean, really. Every single one of your cells, what are we talking, billions? I'm no scientist. <laughs> There's a lot. <laughs> a lot. And everyone needs oxygen, every one of those cells. So this, I mean, thank goodness it's on autopilot because we couldn't sleep if it weren't. That's true. So again, the trade-off, black and white, is sometimes we want to drive the bus. We want to be in charge of the breathing, not autopilot. We want to be aware. So the stones, we were talking about stones. So I have just this backpack. I just brought this backpack and I have my little towel, my welcome mat wrapped up in it. And inside I have these stones. And I'm just pulling them out, random. Guilt. Guilt. Okay. Why would a caregiver feel guilty? I'll answer only for myself. Why would I feel guilty? When I think about guilt... Right, I don't want to run away like I don't want to feel that. What is the positive thing that guilt has to offer to me? And it changes, Jennifer, day by day, 
every time I do a meditation and I think about guilt, it comes up different for me. And so I might breathe in and think to myself or even say, hello, guilt, my little friend. It's nice to see you. I am welcoming. Sometimes we have, think about the holidays. Sometimes there's visitors that come to the, your house for the holidays. They're not as welcomed as others. That's true. But, <laughs> but there's a place for everybody at the Thanksgiving table. That and is true. everybody's welcome, right? Mm-hmm. Or they should be. And sometimes their intention is, is wonderful. We may have difficulty relating to them, but they came to your house with good intentions giving them the benefit of the doubt. Guilt reminds me of where I want to be versus where I'm, where I'm at. Or doing something, doing something that I think I shouldn't be doing, wanting to do something else. So if I think, and there's no hard and fast answer here. If I think about guilt that, am I feeling guilty because I want my dad I'm thinking about my dad being in a memory care facility. Why am I thinking that? I'm thinking that because he just pooped his pants and now I have to go clean it up. And that's very, very difficult. This is serious. This is serious life. I mean, before a year and a half ago, walking into this, life was very different as it is for all of us caregivers. Mm -hmm. I was interviewing a, a friend who's a director at a memory care facility and there was an emergency and she said to me, I will never forget this. The interview stopped. She said, this is real life. I got to take care of this. Right? It was life and death in her house. It's not a house. It was a real facility, but figuratively speaking in her house, she was in charge. Mm -hmm. She had nurses. She had a, a large staff. This is real life. This stuff. Well, when my dad poops his pants and I need to attend to him, this is real life. Of course, I'm going to be thinking about give me a break. <laughs> of course, I'm going to be thinking about laying out in Malibu on a nice warm day. So in that sense, guilt helps me think of life beyond this. It's a positive thing. My life and your life, Jennifer, is not always going to be the difficulty of caregiving. There are days it feels change. like that's all it's going to be, but you're right. It does. Often it does. And that leads to such depression and anxiety, but it's not going to be that way. Just like the clouds change. One day it's raining. One day it's sunny. It's going to change. That is true. So this helps me focus and realize that, for one thing, we're all, we're all in this together. We are not alone. I mean, that's why you and I are relating on mm -hmm. the level that we're relating. That's why I was able to tell you about my friend whom you don't know, who runs a memory care facility, and say, this is real life. And bam, you understood what that meant, the seriousness of it. Because you're in it. Because you're living it. I could think of examples that have happened where my mom lives. Serious stuff. Mm hmm So let me pull out another one here. Anger. Ah, oh, that's the one I feel a lot. You like this one. More energy. So we want to let it be. We don't want to say it doesn't exist. To be mindful is to accept all of these things. So if you would be so kind to share... The, the anger, how does, that, how does that come about for you? Well, my mom has gotten very combative. She needs more help, which I'm sure you can relate to, but she doesn't think she needs help, and she's a control freak, for lack of a kinder term. She has no control over anything, so she literally lashes out. She scratches, she swears at people, she calls you bad word names, it's not pretty. The other two weeks ago, she told me to drop dead. And I'm like, I'm trying to bring you, this is what I'm thinking, because obviously explaining this to her would just be like spitting in the wind. I'm trying to give you moments of joy, some, some peace, some pleasures. Not that she doesn't have those where she lives, but I'm trying to provide the, it's like I'm trying to make the end times of her life, the end of this part of her life 
as pleasant as possible because we all know Alzheimer's is not at all pleasant. And so when she gets angry at me or fights with me, like yesterday I asked her, she was doing the same thing your dad does, just blah, 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 words. And, and I'm desperately trying to find any clue, which sometimes I have to remember that that's not smart. Because if I'm, you know, scrunchy face, listening, contemplating, thinking like, what the hell is she talking about? And she sees that expression, she gets angry. And so I have to be super care. I mean, I have to be almost like, like a rag doll, just whatever and happy and oh sure okay and blah 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 you know it's just i almost have to like turn off everything that's me so when she gets angry with me or frustrated or she gets very passive aggressive oh don't worry about it and it's like lady i am just trying to give you pleasures and her mom likely had alzheimer's she had she went the same way my mom is and it was either a brain aneurysm or alzheimer's or both not sure I'll never know for sure. My mom was lucky to visit her mom once a month. That, that was a good, a good month she went once. I go every week. So there's times when it's like, dang it, you know, I'm doing a lot better than you did, so just knock it off. And then I have to back off because I know when I feel that, she feels it. I don't even have to express it. So if I feel frustrated, angry, and it doesn't even have to be at her, if I'm just stressed, it's better to just skip the visit because I will probably trigger her into telling me to drop dead <laughs> or calling me a female dog. <laughs> they don't know what they're doing. That's true. And then I get angry because it's like my dad, you know, they, they bought their house in 1970 uh, for those people who live in California, like you do, you know, we have Prop 13, so their, how, their property taxes are pff, nothing. And she's got money. My dad invested. She's got money. You know, she should be traveling. She should be doing stuff with her three grandkids. My daughter's 28, my niece is 14, and my nephew's almost 11. She should be doing stuff with the grandkids. Not screaming at me over some perceived whatever. I don't even know what's going through her mind. It just shouldn't be happening. And that's the other anger. It's like, this isn't right. I mean, she lived a good life. What, why does she have to be like this? I would barely wish Alzheimer's on, on evil people. <laughs> Most certainly don't wish it on people like your dad or my mom. You know, There's probably not too many people that really deserve it. If That's, <laughs> that's a really terrible thing to say. <laughs> But yeah, that's where the anger comes up. It's like, you shouldn't have to be living like this. And I shouldn't have to try so hard to give you simple pleasures. I understand that. I understand that. I like to cook and I provide a lot of meals for my dad. And it's a sense of giving just as you go and make yourself vulnerable to your mom. Only to give to her only out of your loving kindness for her. And what I'm understanding is that she's not recognizing that, certainly not giving that back to you in a, in a tangible, any sort of tangible way at all. And so if I go out of my way to make this really nice breakfast and then I pour him this glass of milk and he goes, this milk is really good. <laughs> well, that took five seconds to pull out of the refrigerator and I didn't milk the cow or raise the cow. I simply poured it in the glass. How are the, uh, how are the eggs Benedict, by the way, dad? <laughs> Enter self-compassion, right? We need to be there for ourselves. And I relate to you a lot, Jennifer, because you are the child, the adult child of, of a person with Alzheimer's. You know, as we both know from fellow caregivers at support groups, the spouses, I mean, we're talking about soulmates of 30, 40, 50 years. And one thing is that we can all take stock in really doing a wonderful, wonderful thing, a wonderful job for our loved ones living with Alzheimer's because we're there for them. At, at even the most basic level, we are there. We didn't bail. As I said, it would have been easier for me to not deal with my little friends here, my <laughs> anger, my guilt, my fear, my this and that. 
hey, it's a lot easier to go do something else. This is a, a difficult choice to make day after day. So could you just do me one favor and give yourself a pat on the back, a sincere pat on the back, because you deserve it and all family caregivers deserve it, really do. And by the way, that felt pretty good, didn't it? Yeah, it actually did. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And so your mom, you know, without Alzheimer's, perhaps she would do that. I don't know your mom. Suffice it to say, it would be warranted. It would certainly be warranted. It would be a kind and loving thing to do for you as you show your love and kindness. Just she, be- would, she would tell somebody else what a great job I was doing. She wasn't really good at, I think she was afraid I'd get a fat head mm. because I very frequently didn't hear compliments unless I got them secondhand from hearing her tell somebody else. And I'm not even sure she was aware that she would tell three people and never say kindness to me. So this, you know, her, the way she acts isn't a hundred percent out of, you know, it's, you know, people say, well, it's the disease. I'm like, the disease is enhancing this negative part of her personality. It is part of who she was. So maybe that's why the anger pops out more frequently than I would like, because it's just, you know, the whole thing is so frustrating. (laughs) Very frustrating, extremely frustrating. And I think it comes to ourselves to have to deal with these difficult emotions and to offer ourselves the compassion where others can't. And so you bring up a really, really interesting point. Thank you for sharing about that, which is the idea of the inner critic and that Barring someone who was just intentionally crummy to us, but someone who had our best interest at hand, but had their own limitations. A caregiver, a childhood caregiver who had her own limitations, wasn't able to show you the love that you needed because maybe she didn't get it from her family because who knows why? A million and one reasons. Reasons that would perhaps be interesting contemplation for a meditation i don't know you know but nonetheless for this discussion the point is that if you can be mindful to sit quietly for a few moments or again going throughout your day and thinking about that inner voice in your head that critic that person who is so nasty usually research shows that we are 80 percent more inclined to be nicer to our friends than ourselves. 6% of the folks that were interviewed were nicer to themselves, as perhaps should be. Was that leave 16% or thereabouts, some change, that is sort of uh, equal? Hmm. I know personally, Jennifer, if I spoke to you the way I would speak to myself, we wouldn't be having this conversation. (laughs) I wouldn't have any friends. You know, you get out there and you ba ba ba, and I'm not taking no for an answer, and ba 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 ba. What? I would never talk to a friend like that. Oh, I'm really sorry you're having such a difficult day. And I'm I'm being sincere. I'm not putting on a show. I would talk to a friend. I'm so sorry. You feel bad. I'm really upset for you that you didn't get the promotion, that your mom was nasty to you, on and on and on, right? Uh, If you called a friend and said, you know, God forbid, I'm getting a divorce, what would your friend say? What would you say to your friend? What would your posture be? Oh, I'm so sorry to hear that. I'm sure everything's going to be just fine. Things always have a way of working out right you would say comforting things that is true right you wouldn't go well this is this is really great what the hell did you do this time (laughs) right even though sometimes that might actually be warranted in that situation (laughs) and if it is it is so be it so let it be there but just again black and white night and day if it is warranted there's also the warranting of some kindness, some self-kindness. I can see that. I try to, oops, sorry. I try to, like when I'm leaving, I try to like almost dismiss feeling negative. Like, oh Lord, why does she have to be like, I'm like, no, don't, you just, like I try to focus on whatever else is going to happen. I go on Mondays to visit her. So I try to think, okay, what's happening tomorrow? What's happening the rest of the week? And I try to look for all the positive things 
that are coming up. Like, you know, Wednesday mornings, I ride my bike with a group of friends and that's lovely. And I didn't get to do that last week because last week was nuts. And, you know, so I look, I, I kind of tuck all the negative stuff like, okay, that mom visits over, put that away in this little cubby and, and think about everything else. And maybe I should be processing the negative emotions instead of trying to deny them. Yeah, and trying to deny that there's a big pink elephant in the room only makes you can think about the big pink elephant more so in that room. you got to let the pink elephant be there. And if you're thinking about things like, I have just foregone a bike ride so that I can be here to show my mom how I care for her, how I love her. I'm here to be, to make it pleasant for my mom. That's the only thing I'm here for. I'm not here to teach her anything. There's no teaching anymore, right? No. I, yeah. I mean, when my, when my baby pooped her, pant, her diapers, there was, now listen, baby Danielle, we use the toilet, knowing that at some point she's going to use the toilet. That is true. I, when dad poops his diapers, I'm cleaning it up, and I don't need to say a word because he can't even remember what I told him 10 minutes later. There's no teaching. There's just dealing. That is very true. There's only living with it. That so is the hard part, too. <laughs> you know, for me, it was very difficult before I understood that he's not the person that he was. And I, and I realized that you said that there are certain aspects that are still recognizable as the person that your mom always was. And especially when it comes to soulmates, I see that really throws them. Cause you know, there's good days and bad days in Alzheimer's. And it's like suddenly, like let's say, I remember uh, one fellow caregiver had made the decision, an agonizing decision, should she place her husband? She finally came to terms, he had bowel incontinence and she, she just couldn't cope anymore. She didn't have, other family members children living with her to help it, it was her and him mm. and she couldn't deal she had finally made this decision and of course when you bring your car to the mechanic it performs properly the toothache <laughs> no longer hurts when you get to the dentist yeah, the dog is hurt. dog is not limping when you get to the vet <laughs> right. beautiful hair day the day of the haircut so i don't know why this works but so her husband sort of rebounded and now she felt so guilty and so torn. Maybe I was a bad decision. Maybe I was premature. What was I thinking? So this really, really throws us. But one good day in 20, that, that doesn't mean anything. And tomorrow we're going right back, maybe further down. That is true. I'll take the good day. Thank you. I'll enjoy it. But it doesn't change anything. I guess I get very frustrated because I'm just trying to provide simple joys. I mean, I'm not even trying to do big things because that would be just frustrating for both of us. But when she gets angry or frustrated or just lashes out, it's like, I don't even know why I'm bothering at this point. <laughs> and my husband will say, well, if she's going to scratch you and, and swear at you, why are you going every week? And I'm like, yeah, because she's my mother. I don't even always have a good answer for that. That's even harder. Because you care. I guess that should be easy to admit, but I don't know why that's not always easy. I'm guessing. I, I've only had the pleasure of just meeting you recently, but I'm, I think that there's so many similarities among caregivers. As I, as I said, the reason that we're here is because we care and we love. And it's not easy, and we have these multitude of difficult feelings. Uh, it's just how it is. But at the end of the day, we care greatly about these people. And to care about somebody else means that you also care about yourself, because you cannot love someone else if you don't love yourself. Yeah, that's true. You sometimes know love. You, sometimes when you're caregiving, it sure doesn't feel like you love yourself. <laughs> Well, you know how you had said that she, she recognizes even the slightest uh, emotion coming through? Mm-hmm. I assure you, Jennifer, she knows the fact that you show up, however she responds, is whatever she does. But you are, are you know, going through such tremendous 
tremendous effort. You were giving such tremendous love by putting yourself out there, being vulnerable, accepting these difficult, these difficult emotions that you're dealing with, asking to, to talk with me like we are. That is in itself an act of self-compassion. You're interested in how can you help yourself feel better. In and of itself, that is a compassionate behavior. And so that's what I was talking about, whether you're driving, chopping vegetables, however it is, these are compassionate acts. These are pragmatic ways of experiencing mindfulness and doing things that are compassionate to yourself. Having a cup of tea, coffee, taking a bath. As you said, you can't always take a break. Maybe you said that in a different conversation, but it's true. Yeah, so, especially for those people like yourself that are caring for someone at home. Yeah, hand on the heart while you're talking to that person who's not making sense can make a huge difference. The reason that this feels good or this feels good or this feels good is because of the part of our brain called the amygdala, which is the oldest part of our brain, and it's responsible for re releasing the feel-good hormones such as oxytocin, and even opioids, which is crazy to, to think that we have opioid receptors and that we actually generate biologically a type of opium substance. Naturally, it makes us feel good. And so your brain doesn't know if your husband is caressing you like this. It's like having a, a nightmare or a really great dream. You wake up with the sweats, you're huffing and puffing. You don't really know if it was real or Memorex. <laughs> now you're dating yourself <laughs> i'll accept that i will accept that <laughs> rest of you guys can, well fortunately my audience is probably our age so it's okay but <laughs> it the rest of you can google it <laughs> right right so we don't know uh and our brain responds by releasing those hormones the same way so be kind to yourself release those hormones especially when you feel that you're getting stressed out when you're getting anxious you might need to give yourself a nice pep talk before you walk into the facility you know remind yourself that you're here breathing in you know nourishing those cells breathing in i'm here to be calm and to spend some quality time with my mom whatever she does she does bring it on you got to say bring it on because there's nothing you can do anyway it's probably coming anyway <laughs> it's coming yeah, that makes sense. Maybe I just work so hard at giving her pleasures, I get too frustrated when it doesn't seem to succeed. Because maybe she's having more a better time than it appears. It was weird yesterday when, you know, she's just talk, 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 talk. And interestingly enough, yesterday was the third anniversary of the death of my dad. And she's yap, 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 talking about her husband. Now it's it wasn't like memories or, you know, my husband this. And I said, well, well, where is Chuck? You know, because she thinks I'm her best friend. So if I ask her, where's dad? I just get baffled expressions, which is really hysterical. And so I said, well, so what's Chuck up to? And she goes, I really don't know. And then she goes, oh, da, 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 da. and so I said, well, so are you guys going to take a vacation? And that made her mad. It was like really crazy. And I have it on video. I got to cut short in the video a little bit so I could put it on social media. But it was like, she's like, I don't know what you're telling me to do. I'm like, I'm not telling you to do anything. <laughs> I know better than that. It was just very strange. I think it was a reaction because my dad was very controlling. So I don't know. It was very, it was weird. So as soon as she started getting angry, I just pivoted to something else. And I'm like, I don't need to be told to drop dead this week. <laughs> I think that's what the Alzheimer's Association recommends is to redirect and not challenge them which by the way the the alzheimer's association in the caregiver essentials they do teach mindfulness and they do teach meditation and such so if it's okay for the for the alzheimer's association to be into this it must be all right oh you need every tool you can gather together and Scott and I missed each other at Advocacy Day back in February. Next, next year, we'll be able to meet up in person. It's nice. a little easier for me to get to Sacramento than for you. Scott is in Southern California, and I'm not. I'm in Northern California. 
It's like an hour and a half drive for us. It was an airplane ride for me. Yeah, I saw that on your videos. That was the other thing is I want to tell everybody about the videos that you make because they're really great. You, you obviously have a, a cinematic uh, flair. You know, as I said, it's real life and it's difficult and it's not too hard. You don't have to dig too deep to catch those feelings. No, but you put them in video quite well without it being heavy. Thank you. We, yeah. we don't want to... Uh, we want to be lifted up. And I have people who have said, oh, I know I should listen to your podcast, but, oh, I'm afraid to. And I'm like, oh, let me explain something to you. There's a lot of laughing in a lot of my episodes. It's, a, it's all conversation. I said, you're never going to listen to an episode and feel bummed out. You're, there's always going to be a tidbit you can use. You'll, it, at the very least, you'll be able to say, oh, I'm so glad I'm not the only one that feels like that because I put it all out there. You know, I tell people things like, yeah, I get angry. And, you know, sometimes it's like, who should I be saying that? But it's like, you know what? It's that is part of this journey. And I'm sharing my journey just like you are so that other people who are maybe in the earlier stages with their loved one can say, oh, okay, well, ugh, it doesn't get better. That's for sure. But, you know, they're surviving. And look at, I'm going to use some of these tools that Scott's telling Jen about or, you know, you're not the first one that I've talked to in the last week about breathing. So that's obviously important and self, you know, like mental self care, like appreciating what you're doing. So I've heard that message twice in less than a week. So we're going to, everybody else going to get to hear it soon too. <laughs> and what you said about, letting people know that they're not alone. That is a huge, huge part. I think oftentimes we tend to alienate or isolate, whether it's intentional or not, if we're just in the house because we're so busy tending to our loved one. And to know that others are going through something similar, it to me, it makes me say, well, as you said, you know, if, if Hey, Jen's got it really rough. Her mom can be really, really nasty. Okay, so I'm making dinner and I'm only getting that was great milk. But <laughs> at least I'm not getting, you know, um, verbal ab abuse. Yeah, that's relatively new. I mean, she didn't, she was really easy for the first two and a half years since my dad passed away, but the last six to nine months been like, yikes, lady, you're making this really tough. <laughs> And there's times when it's interesting because I've, I talked to somebody whose spouse, she was a guest on the show in February and I knew I talked to her back in November, but her topic was perfect for the week of Valentine's day. That was Alzheimer's and intimacy. Those people who haven't aren't, aren't up to date. And between our talk, like you and I are doing and the release of her episode, her husband passed away. And I thought about that. I was like, what the heck am I going to do with my Monday afternoons when mom's gone? And it, and it was like, I kind of experienced a little sense of loss. Like that's going to be really weird because I've been doing it for three years. And before that was three months of going once a week with my dad's mom while he was on hospice. So it's like, Oh, this is, it's going to be very interesting. So there's days I'm ready for it. And there's days I'm like, oh, I don't think I'm ready. Even when she's telling me to drop dead or, calling me names, which thankfully I don't get as often as the caregivers. So I'm, I'm, I've talked to enough people recently that I think I have a path forward that might help them help her not be like that. So hopefully, hopefully they'll try my suggestions because mm -hmm. that's the best we could do is just keep, keep trying to find the best way forward for ourselves and our loved ones so that we don't end up killing each other. So that we can survive this journey also. Definitely. And that we can make it pleasant, which is what you said is your, your main goal, to make life as beautiful as possible for your mom as she goes through this. And for you also to participate in, in a nice, as nice as possible journey. Maybe that's why I get frustrated when it's not, not as pretty and pleasant as I would like. That's probably why it frustrates me because it's like, I would really prefer not to have negative memories. My dad was, um, he got verbally abusive while he was on hospice. His mind went back 20 years and 
and he was always frustrated. And he and I are very similar personalities, so I understood what was going on, you know, subconsciously with him, but we went from having a very good relationship to a very contentious one, and then he died. So I betcha I don't like it when I have contentions with my mother because it's like, I don't, that's not what I want to remember because that's what I'm remembering with my dad. So, whoo, whoo, breakthrough. <laughs> there you go. A little mindfulness. Yeah. <laughs> you know, just, just thinking about what was going on. So that that's, makes sense. See, I have to talk to 15 people before I figure it out. <laughs> So a little, a little plug, if it's all right. Oh, and definitely. So there is a uh, PhD gerontologist in the New York area by the name of Michelle Olson. And she and I are putting together a video, an online video class with all of this sort of material. It's a comprehensive class. It'll be available this spring. Awesome. And so it walks you through from the beginning through an eight to 10 week course, undecided at this point. And it depends, it depends how that goes uh, as far as each week's amount of content. People are busy. That's essentially what it comes down to. Caregivers are busy. And so we have a lot to, to talk about. Should we do it all in one week or should we spread it out over? You know? so, I would say spread it out. Did you ever do the savvy caregiver training through the Alzheimer's Association? Yes. Okay. I did the three week version instead of the six uh -huh. because that I think in, in my era, well, it was the first time they were offering it in my town and we are in the far flung. You cannot get any further in the suburbs of San Francisco and still be in the Bay area. Well, you know, hop, skip and a jump down the road and you're in Stockton's County Stanislaw, whatever. <laughs> I don't go over there that often. So, but you're, you know, you're over into a whole different part of the state. So whenever they have something in my hometown, it's like you make an effort to go. So they had it, it was three weeks and it worked out perfect. I could go to the gym and then quick shower, pop over to the church where the uh, support group I attend is. And they had this class and one gal actually took the six week version. And then she took the three week version as kind of a, refresher course and she thought the six weeks was better but three weeks kind of fit into people's schedules better so it's hard to know which way to jump maybe you could do an accelerated one although if it's online can they go back and watch videos and sure you can yeah keep so your own at your own uh comfort sure so that sounds good so where where are they where Will they find those classes? That'll What's be hosted on Udemy. Udemy? Uh-huh. And so I will send you a link that uh, perhaps you can post. I will, I will put it in the show notes for sure. Appreciate and it. then you have all these fantastic videos on Facebook. Yes. Scott so, Lavitt. Uh, uh, Facebook. What is it? Facebook slash Scott Lavitt. L-A-V-I-T-T. V as in Victor. I-T-T. Author. And I will link that as well, because like I said, those are really awesome videos. Thank you. And then do you have a last tip for anybody? I do. And that is just to allow your, your difficult feelings to take place, because as we know, we're not going to get rid of them anyway. So let them be there. And the idea is to try and transform them. We want all of our feelings. A bad day doesn't define who we are. We have good days. We have bad days. There's a certain essence to each one of us. And one one slip one getting aggravated one wish i hadn't said that is not that's not defining so the idea is to transform think of the and i don't want to get too philosophical on you i won't get all buddhist on you here <laughs> but if you think of the sun rising or setting right it goes from either let's take the sunrise as just do one okay it goes from dark and it gradually becomes lighter until the sunrise so beautiful in its orange it doesn't go black, white, oh, it doesn't go night, day, it transforms. And that's, that's essentially how we want our feelings. That is really the way that our healthy feelings come about anyway, naturally. They transform. We go from having difficult feelings to something positive happens and we start to feel good and we get on an upward spiral. So let it all be there. Don't beat yourself up. We're good people. That is very true. I really